There we go. So again, welcome to the Houston Microsoft Technology Center. We have other folks joining us remotely from all over the nation, uh, customers and, and partners and, and our uh, sales executives as well. So I'm going to be discussing our capabilities as quickly as I can. This is the 30 second sponsored by type reality of, of this meeting. Uh, but absolutely, what I have to tell you is not nearly as important as what you need to know or what you want to know. So please feel free to interact and ask questions. So today I thought I'd cover very quickly, super speed, portfolio of solutions, discovery and challenger paths, and leading the conversation. And what I mean by leading the conversation is you're out in your organizations having to um, sell Skype for Business, Microsoft Solutions to your board of directors. And so our goal, our job as we see it is not only to partner with fantastic partners, independent software vendors, but also to uh, help you in leading the charge, leading that conversation out in the, out in the world. So with that, I should turn this on and there we go. So this was today's agenda, and we've recorded some of this. We've live broadcasted other parts of this. So all of these decks and all of this information will be presented to you at a later time. Uh, my name is Aaron Romeo. I am a partner SSP as well as a Microsoft Community Center specialist, uh, event specialist. Uh, and you've got my email address. So if any one of you has the hankering to ask, will we get these slides later or will we get these recordings later, Go ahead and jot down my email address right now and start emailing me every minute or two uh, for that, and I will absolutely respond to you. I will create a OneDrive for all of this material at a later time. So it's eromeo at converge1.com, and uh, my job is to answer your questions on the pre-sales and sales lead side for Skype, the Skype for Business or Microsoft pro Productivity Practice. So who is Converge One? Some of you know us because you're our customers. Some of you know us because I reached out to you. Uh, Converge One is based on these five principles on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, when I was recruited here about a year ago almost, uh, we started with a very firm foundation building the Microsoft productivity team, not just being the voice team, but actually changing and becoming the Microsoft productivity team. And you can see what we've built on top of that from there. We've uh, empowered our sales folks to answer questions around Azure, O365, et cetera. And now we're facing the outside world. This year is about ecosystem, the Microsoft channel, uh, some Microsoft folks have poked in and out of this room, uh, you know, asking how are we going. Some of you are here because you were invited by Microsoft. So that's all good. And again, thanks for your time. So if you want to learn more about our Microsoft capabilities, yep. Uh, Sean, can you direct them to lunches, please? They just walked in. Yeah, bags, salads, et cetera. Thanks. Uh, go to our website, uh, converge1.com, click on Microsoft, and you'll see all of our competencies. What's not listed here plainly is the fact that we're a Microsoft Surface Hub a reseller and implementer. And if you don't know what that is, let me take you over to the device room later, and we'll play around and have some good fun with the Surface Hub. It's a team computing platform. Our five core differentiators are here on the, on the right side. Intelligration, which is intelligent migration. Uh, with your existing plastic wares. I understand you bought it. You got to use it till it disintegrates on the desk. We'll help you figure out that, right? Uh, also, contact center, contact center, which Corey taught me how to say that. Uh, contact center assessment, which is how to use multimodality video in the contact center realm. Agreement advisor, are you buying too much Microsoft? Are you not buying enough Microsoft? What could you use? What couldn't you use? Maintenance and proactive monitoring and ecosystem feed. So the fact that all these partners are in the room uh, represents, the, and, and these are just some of our partners, uh, represents the reality that we have a healthy stable of independent software vendor and ecosystem partners. So I was at Enterprise Connect uh, last year. Anybody in the room there? Raise your hand if you're at Enterprise Connect. Two people, okay, great. Uh, Enterprise Connect used to be the old voice con and huge Microsoft presence this year. And I was, you know, flabbergasted by the Microsoft presence because, you know, I'm used to voice con being about plasticware. And I heard a lot of, you don't want to get Ubered. Okay, don't get Ubered. And I thought, why are we going somewhere? What do you mean, don't get Ubered, right? Are we going to another location? So I started looking this up in the Urban Dictionary and I, I typed in my good old Bing bar, 
What does it mean to don't get Ubered? And I found a number of different, this has been around, this nomenclature has been around for a while. Show of hands, who uses Uber or has Uber on their application? Linda would like some help with that later. Linda needs some, some guidance on how to use Uber. But anyway, so here are the definitions. Uber, first, if you're gonna go get schnockered, don't drink and drive, get Ubered, right? Second definition, uh, when your job or business becomes completely irrelevant because of some new fledgling technology. In the gaming industry, it's if I Uber you, that means I completely own you, Andrew. <laughs> okay, it means that I have superior skills or superior technology and Uber it is a way of saying you don't want to get blindsided. Now, I go a lot of places and I Uber all the time and certainly you've seen this that 52% uh, of the Fortune 500 have disappeared in the last, uh, you know, in the last 17 years, whatever the case may be. Uber, anybody know the, the born on date for Uber? Okay, we'll hold that question later. It's not an extra credit uh, question. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a second. But when I talk to Uber drivers or people about Uber, I get a lot of emotional response, especially in a third world country. Oh yeah, I know, hate Uber, you know. Uh, and then I was in Austin when Uber was kicked out uh, that weekend, and I had taxi cab drivers complaining, bring Uber back. We can't handle it. It's, they're crazy. These people are calling us and texting us, and right? And so there's a lot of emotional response to Uber, and I want to really ask the question, why is there so much emotion? Well, there's a lot of economic impact. Uh, how does Uber affect our economy? It's not just about the taxi cab drivers. Any other ways? Raise your hand. Anyone? Lyft. Okay, well, Lyft is a direct competitor, right? I mean, Lyft and Uber are fighting it out. You know, uh, may the force be with you, dark side, whatever. They're 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 fighting each other. But any other industries that Uber impacts? Good answer. The rent a car companies, for sure. I don't rent a car anymore when I go to a city. I just Uber where I need to go. It doesn't make any sense to rent a car. I could pay $60, $70 to rent a car per day, or I could just Uber where I want to go. So I'm not getting a car. And because I'm not getting a car, I'm also not parking the car. And if I'm not parking the car, right, then I'm, there's revenue being affected there. The city loses some tax revenue. The shuttle services out of the airport, now there's Uber Pool. Uber's also dipped into food delivery. You no longer have to eat cardboard boxes out of cardboard boxes. It's not all pizza anymore. You can order Uber Eats from anywhere. And now Uber's also come in and said, okay, we're going to lease the vehicles. So they're taking a little bit away from car leasing companies. And there have been some uh, symbiotic attachments, other companies that have attached themselves to Uber drivers, like Amazon Flex. Anybody know what that is? Raise a hand. Okay. They're in my neighborhood all the time. They'll say to an Uber driver, hey, you're looking for rides put these packages in your trunk and deliver all of these today and we'll pay you, you know, X amount of dollars for delivering. So therefore they don't have to pay for FedEx, UPS, you get the idea. And another impact that Uber has made is on the Walmart greeters of the world, because it seems like every Walmart greeter has fled Walmart and is now absolutely driving Uber cars. Uh, and I can always tell who drives at night because they have rubber mats. But anyway, that's a whole nother story for another time. But my point is that Uber has really taken over. We've heard a lot about it, right? And why has it taken over? Well, because it's super simple. If you've got a cell phone, a virtualized computing platform, you can be an Uber driver, right? Now you gotta have a car and you know clean record and all those things. But if I'm a driver, I need a cell phone. That's the technological need. If I'm a rider, what do I need? A cell phone. So all I'm doing is I'm just opening my app and I'm saying, pick me up, and that's that. End of story. It's like sending a text message, right? Wrong. There's totally so much more by way of data management and confluence of business intelligence. First of all, we need a, a mobile commerce networking engine called a 3G or 4G networking infrastructure, right? We've got to be able to talk back and forth. Also, we're not crunching all that data on a 386 tape drive from Adam that you bought back in 1982. We're using cloud computing and cloud fabric to make this happen. And in fact, there are presentations and stories, and soon there will be a movie released soon about Uber analytics, right? Oh, well, they've made a movie about everything else, but you, you get what I'm saying, Uber analytics. They're trying to identify who's where, when will you be done with your ride? When can you pick up somebody else? When can we charge the customer more because the demand is higher? This is what analytics and big data is all about. Is this making sense? So. My question is, why am I talking about Uber? Well, it's to ask this question, is Uber a good thing? 
What do you think? Is Uber a good thing? Yes. Yes? Well, it's a good thing because it keeps cars off the road, right? It's car sharing. Why else is it good? Keeps drunks off the road. Keeps drunks off the road. Thank you, sir. Right? So it's green. It's safer, right? Okay. For the driver, it's a super good thing because, hey, I can turn this app on, make money anytime I want, right? Hustle when you want or whatever their commercial is saying, right? So think about the worker side of it as well as your side of it. Uber is so less expensive than a taxi. We know that or a limousine service, right? Uh, so it's good for us as a consumer because it's more efficient, but it's also good for the worker. Thus the introduction of the sharing economy. Now I promise I'm going to land the plane. Stay with me. The sharing economy is all about data and the democratization of cloud computing or of computing in general made possible by the cloud. So we're not here just to talk about voice today, but the sharing economy does not just apply to Uber. In 2014, a company called Crowd Companies did a honeycomb diagram here of all the different products involved in the sharing economy. One was Lyft. Ding, ding, ding. Thanks, Ken. Another was Uber. Any, any other products or services that you do business with on this? Raise your hand. Have you ever bought anything off Craigslist? All right. Ms. Mr. Burka? Not Craigslist, but others. Others, okay. Uh, did you know that you can get a virtual assistant online? Here's TaskRabbit. Here's Tackle is a new one in Houston. There's a big billboard up on 610, Tackle. We'll talk about it in a minute. Right? You know you can get funding for your inventions online, right? Crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. So all of these services are kind of evolving out of this collaborative economy. And it is Data Fest 2017. You got tools sitting in your garage, you want to loan them to somebody else for a fee, boom, here's an app for to do that. You got cardboard boxes you moved and you want to get rid of the cardboard boxes, but you don't want to throw them away in the landfill. Somebody else could use them, boom, there's an app for that. You got a bedroom upstairs that you're not using because the kids went away to college, boom, there's an app for that. You can Airbnb your, your brains out, right? So the reality is that all of this is happening because of a confluence of business intelligence or data and it's becoming more and more readily available. I was looking for a job when I found this one. I have a 19 year old daughter. She's bored, she's at home, you know. What do I do, you know, go flip you know, burgers or toss pizzas. Nobody will intern her yet because she's only a sophomore. So I said, well, why don't you see what you can get done on Tackle or TaskRabbit now? Does she take the advice? I don't know, we'll see. But the point is that you can get grocery shopping, tasks, lawn work, all sorts of stuff done in a pay-as-you-go capacity. And so a day in the life in 2014 of interactions looked like this. Of course, from 2014 to now, it's grown quite a bit. It's estimated by Upwork that 53 million American freelancers have some kind of part-time gig, right? Poshmark or, you know candles or whatever the case is and they're advertising and doing it through the social media realities all of that data is organized by big data and to give you an example or give you just an inkling of how much opportunity there is and how much fabric computing is going to grow let's look at the big names here facebook been around since 2004 you can see 140 let's see 140 yeah 140 billion 1.4 billion subscriptions or users per month. You can look at the difference in Uber, which was established in 2009. There's your answer. And it's just a, a sliver of that. So there's so many more of us that could be Ubering. There's so many more of us that could be buying things in the restroom from Amazon, web app, right? My, my point is that this is not going away. It's slowly growing. I know if you're like me, you were around and you saw that dot com bust, right? Well, that was because there was a difference between the idea and the actual monetization of the idea. Now the ideas are starting to monetize. They're starting to come forward. And the reality is you don't want to get Ubered. So how does the Microsoft channel see the world? So try to keep this in mind. We are Microsoft resellers. We're a cloud solution provider, but we're not Microsoft. We've got all sorts of vendors, all sorts of partners. We're, we're a healthy, living, breathing, you know, entrepreneurial type ecosystem. How does Microsoft see the world matters, though, in how they are speaking to you. So looking at the world from the Microsoft perspective, how they metric is based upon one of these three Russian nesting doll cloud offerings. This is why they're talking to you about Azure, Office 365, 
or a software as a service reality. This is why they're saying it because that's how they're metric. And that's okay. These are great solutions. I believe in them firmly. That's why I run the Microsoft productivity sales side uh, of this team. So have we heard of Azure? Raise your hand if you've heard of Azure. Anybody using Azure? Keep your hand up if you're using Azure today. One, two people, okay. Office 365, hands in the air if we've got Office 365. Okay, great. So just trying to get some uh, reality of, of, of uh, the customer base here. So it's a cloud within a cloud within a cloud. Azure is infrastructure as a service. It's not rack space. This isn't a colo. This is you want SQL power, we'll sell you SQL power. You want you know XYZ to put your apps on, we'll sell you XYZ to put your apps on. Office 365, conversely, is platform as a service. You're buying the platform, but you're not necessarily getting a bunch of management with that. That's kind of where we come in. Converge One has managed services and hosted offerings, right? Uh, or hosted managed services around that as well. And then last is software as a service. So that's uh, Microsoft Dynamic, it's SharePoint. We can partner with and or deliver anything you need in the Microsoft space. I need to make that clear. We're not just voice. Yes, we've been voice since red light, green light, right? We, we can do that very well. But we also now have expanded our capabilities. So to Microsoft and the Microsoft sellers, Azure is about what your company knows or the business intelligence. O365 is how you share that information back and forth with each other, and hopefully nobody in the outside world, right? That's what intellectual property protection is all about. And Dynamics is what you do with that data, how you execute on that reality. And it's all based on or possible by the graph. Show of hands, who knows what I mean by graph? No problem. Check it out. So graph is the birth of artificial intelligence. Don't get scared, Skynet is not self-aware. This is just intelligent connections. If I'm working on a document that you have worked on, then I would perhaps want to have your contact information up and ready for me. If I have an appointment with you and we've worked on something in the past, I perhaps want the OneNote full page on what we've worked, talked about in the past. It's li literally no different than Google checking out the text in your emails and saying, I see you're writing a lot about bicycles, here's an ad for bicycles. Or Google saying, you have an appointment, you better get going because the tra you know, travel time, the traffic, whatever the case is. It's just making yes, no intelligent associations. At this stage of the game, that's all AI is. It's yes, no, what are the potential possibilities? Now, would it grow beyond? Sure, I'm sure it will, but we're not here today to talk about Skynet, right? So ultimately, what Skype for Business is, is just a small plumbing problem. If you, if you look at the world from the Microsoft seller perspective, Skype for Business is just a plumbing problem about the base way, the call, or the instant message that we humanly interact. And so this is what they look at. We see it a little differently. Converge One, we believe that Skype is the backbone of communication. It's the humanization technology. And then everything else is just fabric. And all the benefits that you want with escalated intellectual mediums and being able to escalate from a chat to a call and all those things make you more efficient, but it's relying upon you having your act together by way of full voice or communicating in the manner in which you're used to communicating. So that's our story. And to us, Skype for Business is a bit like Snooker in, in the world of system integrators. Who knows what I'm talking about? Snooker. Nobody knows Snooker? Some, okay, you know. What is it, sir? Well, it's like pool type game. Good. Good answer. Pool type game. Thorough, to the point. Uh, some, sometimes I've asked that question and people say that's a character on Jersey Shore. No, I'm not talking about Snooky. I'm talking about Snooker, and he's right. It's a harder billiards game. It's a 15-foot table with a whole rack of red balls you have to combo pocket and the inches, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the pockets are actually about an inch smaller than a normal pool table. So what's the point? If you can run a snooker table, then you're gonna dominate that six foot bar table that you can put a 44 ounce uh, glass into the pocket in. You know, the coin op type that does, you know, it's kind of wobbly in the middle. So, so we dominate snooker, we dominate QoS, we dominate voice, we can do it prem, hybrid, uh, in the cloud fully, we're a Skype operations framework, we're, we're dominators, right? 
there's no reason why we can't also assist you and we should need to make aware now that we also are able to help you tie that into your O365 experience as well as your Azure experience in whatever way those connections should be made. So in case you didn't know and in case you want to make sure you pay attention to just one thing that I tell you, this is the one thing that you should pay attention to. We offer Microsoft training. You can buy Microsoft training for us from us on demand. We can guide you through it. Did you know that? You probably didn't. But we are, through our center of excellence, fully certified to offer you Microsoft training. Now, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, man, I don't want to mess with it. Just sell me managed services. Sure, we do that too. But sometimes people want to brain up or skill up their staff, and we, we can do either or. Consulting, that's obvious. How to make the hip bone connect to the knee bone, connect to the toe bone. We can do all those things. So consulting is not just about voice anymore. It could also be about OMS. Room one, we mentioned it, Surface Hub, uh, Skype for Meeting Broadcast, we do all these things. And in fact, today we're recording and broadcasting this to prove our acumen in these abilities, right? Uh, managed services, we've already talked about, O365. Did you know that we're a direct cloud solution provider? We're not a tier two, we're not buying it through tech data, something like that. We actually deal directly with Microsoft, which gives you access to escalations, ticket help. So if you have O365 management concerns, we can help you manage. If you need O365 help in any capacity, come to us and let us know what you're looking at. We're happy to help. And we are certified for EDU as well. I'll slide that in there. EDU for sure. I'm not pointing directly at you, but I am pointing directly. <laughs> All right, right. Secure product of enterprise. Uh, anybody know what this is? Show of hands. Sec SPE. Okay. Next year, you're going to hear more and more about SPE. It's part of the enterprise mobility solution set. Basically, if you're buying antivirus and firewalls, no need anymore. You can do an add-on with your O365 and they'll literally quarantine all inbound communications, make sure it behaves properly before they actually send it to you. It's called zero day threat protection. And that's something that we also have full capability of. No reason to keep paying maintenance on a Kapersky. We can actually uh, help you get beyond that, right? And we guess what? We understand what ports need to be open for voice and QoS as well because we happen to do that as well. Azure. Azure is not, again, rack space, but we can help you to have on-site servers that manage your cloud computing fabric. And we'll talk about some examples of that in just a minute. I'm going to speed up because I don't want to bore anybody. Devices, obvious. Hosting, obvious. Adjuncts, contact center, compliance, recording, fill in the blank. So we do all these things. We're no longer just... Skype for Business, OCS, Link, Voice Specialist. We do all of these things. Let me pause here and make sure we don't have any questions. Great, that means I'm doing an excellent job of presenting because you just are right there with me. Now, who are you? Who are you in this reality? Are you loyal to Avaya or Cisco? Avaya and Cisco are interchangeable here, by the way. Are you deeply invested in plasticware? We just spent a gobble of money. We just re-upped, whatever the case. Are you number two? Are you unsure about Avaya because of the bankruptcy? Are you number three, exploring alternatives actively? So we, we are interested in who you are and how we fit our solution set to you. So if you're number one, no fear. We don't have to come in and try to replace your plasticware. There's no reason to that. Let's talk about other products in Intelligration like Office 365, Microsoft Azure, Secure Productive Enterprise, Training, and, and Surface Hub, right? So that's who we are. So what's the Surface Hub? Surface, Surface Hub, again, is in the device room. It's a beautiful uh, team-centric computing platform. It's not just a consumption device like a Spark board. It is actually a device that you can save work to, collaborate appropriately. a and just bought 100 of these, right, for the, for the classrooms. And it's a collaborative reality. And we're, we're very good at, at doing these things. Room one. So room one, there's, you know, broadcast meetings, Skype for Business broadcast. There's also a huge opportunity in the marketplace for upping the ante on your triangular phones. You probably have some old dusty triangular phones somewhere in your organization, right? Well, guess what? Those can be re-upped to newer, not triangle phones, but now visually enabled, context sharing. This device that you're looking at right over there, that little box, that black box, that is talking to a Logitech camera that I've put my identity, one of my identities on that box, and it's its own separate system. 
It's here in the meeting. It's listening. It's sharing. It's doing video. We could share content through a PC if we so desired, right? So now we can see there's a whole lot of huddle, small huddle room spaces that we could upgrade to and make people more collaborative, more efficient, right? So that's part of room one. Let's take a look at an Azure SQL example. But this, this by the way, should roll your socks up and down if you know anything about fabric computing. So we know that SQL can be purchased in, in different options or different ways, licensing options, principal additions, you're buying enterprise, you're buying standard, whatever the case may be. So it's sold in many different ways. So we picked one way just to have a discussion with you about. We picked SQL Server and Windows Server with four cores in a highly available capacity. Anybody raise your hand know that SQL is being used in your organization? Yeah, everybody, that's probably everybody, right? Okay. So if you were to buy SQL, you'd have to go buy the software cost for one server, which is 20K, minimum of four cores, 200, uh, sorry, two, uh, 28 gig of RAM. And then the next question is, do you need high availability? Sure, you want to be able to fail over. You don't want it, data to be lost or whatever the case may be. So you can see now the software cost there. You've also got physical server costs. You got to go buy physical servers. You decide, right? Dell, HP, whatever you want to buy, right? Then I've given a very, very, very conservative yearly power, battery backup and cooling costs, super conservative because I'm trying to prove a point. $2,000 for hypervisor software or Windows Server software. That's for a grand total. If I'm using, if I'm an organization using SQL, I'm spending in three years or, or just one, the first time 88K for SQL thinking it's going to last me three years until the next edition start coming out. Now, if I wanted to finance that, with no interest, it's $2,400 a month if you can get it financed with no interest. Got it? So to own SQL, own it, Cal, client access license. Not a sell, but a Cal. I'm 88000 Or I can go rent, I can go lease, however you want to package it, the cloud computing capacities and park this for $1,600 $1, a month, which amortized over 36 months equals 57000 so in other words, I can rent it, obviously, cheaper than I can own it. But let's understand, this, this is not the difference between renting and leasing a car. But let's use a car analogy. You buy a Lexus in 2014, you go into the garage, it's still a 2014 Lexus. You go into the garage the next day, it's still a 2014 Lexus. Every day you go in there, it's got an expiration date, right? As opposed to Azure, not only are you spending less money and you're now in a fully CapEx, sorry, OpEx reality as opposed to CapEx, but every time you open the garage, it's a brand new Lexus and it's fully clean, it's ready to go and it's updated and you get to decide, you know, what it feels like and looks like, et cetera. And for the EDU space or .gov or, you know, .org space, uh, you know, they're not giving it away for free, but, but darn near, right? So my, my point is that Azure makes a lot of sense. There are tons of tools that we can talk about, TCO, total cost of ownership on Azure. But more importantly is who are you dealing with upstream? Are your board members uh, cloud um, adopters? So we put that into a persona ratio. Again, I'm going to speed up. Traditionalist, on-prem seeker, integrator. Maybe you have uh, high security demands. Maybe you don't want your stuff in the cloud, public or private, or G Cloud in the government's uh, Microsoft government space. But the realities are that depending on who you deal with as far as decision-making parties, or maybe you're the decision-making party, great. Take out your checkbook. Let's do some business. But if, you're, if we're selling this upstream, then let, let's help you identify how open are they to cloud computing and how is Microsoft growing and growing and growing in these capacities? Why are they performing in the ways that they're performing? So here's an interesting concept that we just uh, had consulted to us in Denver of last year through uh, at our sales conference. You can see the vendors that are in play and how they line up to the cloud personas. I'm a customer, I manage myself, I want it on-prem all time, great. Microsoft seems to fit every one of those realities very well. And if they're a cloud uh, adopter or a cloud enthusiast, awesome, even better, because we now can help them with SPLA or CSP. SPLA is secure, productive, no. SPLA is service provider licensing authority, and CSP is cloud solution provider, and we're both of those things.
So again, what if you're number one? We've talked about it. What if you're number two? Who are you? If you're number two, you're unsure about a buy, but you've got to use as much of the investment as you possibly can. Great. We can still do all these things, but we can start doing some other interesting stuff like selling UC readiness or selling smart switches like you know some of the partners in the room, right? Uh, we can also help you with contact center, either baseline with ABST or super complex with in-house. Uh, unified messaging. There are a number of places to start. And if you are fully ready to explore the alternatives of digital transformation, then we can absolutely help you with that as well and package all that into managed services reality. So bottom line, we need to know more about your shape, the shape of your organization. You, your organization may be a circle, it may be a square, it may be a triangle. The amount of interaction, intelligent interaction with business intelligence on the left-hand side, and the amount of population, the number of warehouse phones, et cetera, that all matters. And so what we do is a very intensive job of first identifying who you are, what your organization feels like, and that's where we start to make these suggestions. Unified messaging top-down, sorry, bottom-up top-down, full contact center. We're here to help you with all of these realities. Even if just Skype for Business alone, there are instant messaging and presence. Now we graduate to internal calls, and now we graduate to uh, you know, evolve to a fully facing out exterior world. And so our discovery also kind of fits in that modality. We want to know as much as we can about you. And it's real simple, we're CSP. Just give us authorization to look at your licensing, and we can come back to you and say, you got all this licensing. What are you doing with it? You haven't even used it for three years. Why, do you, why is that still in your enterprise agreement or CSP agreement, right? So we can help you with that as well. The big takeaway here is that we're not just voice anymore. We are O365. We are Azure. We are Secure Productive Enterprise. And a lot of these partners are evolving their game to talk those languages as well. They're traditional voice partners, but where all of their research and development is going is in Skype for Business. I mean, if you go to these partners' web pages and you say, what, where are you spending the majority of your research and development dollars? It's all in this technology that eventually, it's not if, but when does your organization adopt, you know? So let me open it up there for questions and make sure that I've covered what you need me to cover. But nobody likes a silent room. And you're on camera too, so I'm watching you. I don't want to call on you, but I will. No questions? Okay. What's that? It was a good introduction. One more time. It was a good introduction. Okay. Thank you, KK. I appreciate it. So with that, we are done super early. Our next presentations actually start in uh, 1 o'clock. Excuse me. So we've got a lot of time to kill. How about we give away some stuff? Does that sound good? One more time. Any questions before I stop recording? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, in the remote world, do we have any questions? I should have asked that. Got uh, six, seven room. We got two rooms and six, seven individuals on. No questions remote. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you. That just means I did a fantastic.